Welcome to the Nanovation Podcast. Information about this and other episodes can be found at fillerlab.com forward slash nanovation. If you like what you hear, be sure to tell a friend or leave a review at Apple Podcasts. It really does help. I welcome your thoughts and suggestions. You can contact me on Twitter at Michael Filler or via email at nanovationpodcast at gmail.com. This is one real issue we have with our patent system. Yeah. It really is the rich come out ahead in the patent system as it is. It's not like someone robbed a bank and the bank doesn't have to hire policemen to go catch the robber. The policemen are there. <laughs> right. They're part of yeah. society <laughs> to catch that robber. That's a good analogy. That's Andrew Hunt, the founder of NGMAT, talking about the challenge of protecting patents. Andrew recently visited Georgia Tech, where we had the opportunity to chat about NGMAT, their nanomaterials manufacturing technology, what motivated him to start the company in 1993, and the secret behind their staying power. We also discussed the pros and cons of today's patent system and how the nanotechnology landscape has changed in the past two and a half decades. Andrew has seen it all. From the early optimism, to the market drops that sunk many of his rivals, to the increasing prevalence of nanomaterials in everyday life. He has a lot to teach us. This is the Nanovation Podcast, an exploration of big innovations emerging from small things. I'm Mike Filler, your host and a professor at the Georgia Institute of Technology. Enjoy the show. It's a pleasure to have uh, Dr. Andrew Hunt here today. Uh, he was the founder and then CEO and CTO of NGMAT for 24 years, from 1993 to 2018. Uh, NGMAT is still a leading nanotechnology firm in the area of thin films and nanopowders. Uh, we're going to talk to him all about that. I will note you might have heard his name because he was a gubernatorial candidate in Georgia in 2014 for the Libertarian Party, uh, and he's a Georgia Tech alum. He was a graduate of the Materials Science and Engineering program, and he's back on campus today to talk with faculty and students. That's why we got lucky and got him in the studio. Andrew, welcome to the podcast. Mike, it's great to be here. Thanks for the invitation. My pleasure. Why don't we start, uh, and maybe you can tell us a bit about the NGMAT name, we'll start light, because it's spelled, for those of you who are listening, lowercase n, capital G-I-M-A-T, NGMAT. Uh, you might think it should be spelled E-N-G-I, Matt, and it turns out today the company has that spelling, but when it started, it was the former spelling, correct? Correct. And so where did that come from? Well, we do nano-engineered materials... And the lowercase n stands for nano, ng stands for engineered and matte materials. Right, so engineered materials. And ngmat.com was available. <laughs> <laughs> So this, and and that was still in ninety three. You had to you had to worry about what was available. Well, actually, we started off as microcoding technologies. Okay. So, so we didn't get into the nanopowders for till the late nineties. I see. Okay. Okay. Um, so then, let's let's dive right into uh, kind of the more recent ng mat technologies in in nanopowders. Um, you all specialize in, well, really a whole variety of different materials. We sell more than 50 different compositions to Sigma Aldrich alone. And so people listening may have very well used your materials in their work. Yes. There's a, there's a good chance if they're doing research with uh, various oxides, a few different metals, and have bought it through Sigma Aldrich, it was made by Ingemet. And so can you talk a bit about uh, the manufacturing process, how you go about making those powders? Yeah, we have a process that actually was initiated as my Ph.D. dissertation here at Georgia Tech. Okay. Uh, back then, I just called it combustion chemical vapor deposition, where you use a flame, you take uh, your precursors, dissolve them in a liquid, 
you finely atomize the uh, liquid, burn it in a flame, and then vapor deposit from the flame. So you're forming these powders in this flame, basically, and then they're falling down on a surface? Is that the right way to think about it? You can, if you go to low concentrations, you maintain everything in a vapor phase. And if you put up a substrate, you get direct vapor condensation onto the surface. So that's what we started with was combustion chemical vapor deposition. I see. To make a film on that surface. And then we realized that sometimes we went to too high a concentration. We got homogeneous nucleation in the gas stream, and you got powder on the surface. Okay. And then people said, wow, that powder's useful. Right, right. <laughs> so then we uh, altered the process and couldn't call it vapor deposition anymore. It was vapor condensation. And we also came up with a new atomizer that could submicron size atomize the liquids, which helped it transition into the vapor phase, even if you use nitrates and low uh, vapor pressure precursors. Okay. So there's basically two modes to operate this in. One yeah. is to make... And I guess you can make films out of both in the end. But one is vapors um, and precursor molecules make it to the surface and form the film there. Or you get this nucleation in the gas phase and then they deposit it on the surface. Or you collect them. Right. right. So if you want to do a film, you keep all the vapors subcritical nucleus size so they're not stable particles. Right. They meld onto the surface and uh, to give a good chemical bond. We can get perfect apotaxy uh, and a uh, wide range really? of different microstructures. Yep. So what uh, can you give us an example of a material that you can get to grow epitaxially? Yeah, we actually developed uh, barium strontium titanate doped with two different materials, so it had five different cation species in it, which in a liquid is easy. Right. Regular traditional vapor processing is very difficult to have five cations. And in a liquid, you can control the stoichiometry perfectly. Right. Uh, so, you know, we then developed an interfacial layer in a certain temperature and were able to grow tetragonal BST epitaxially on hexagonal sapphire. Sapphire yeah. being a low cost, very high, uh, uh, low loss, uh, also uh, microwave uh, substrate. So this was for microwave applications and the gigahertz frequencies. Okay. And so that's one of several um, domains your materials go into, I'm yeah. assuming. We actually got a patent on not the process for doing it. We already had that patent, but a, pro a patent on the epitaxial relationship of BST onto sapphire. No one else had ever accomplished it before. Interesting. And we were able to do that with our process because... We had to run a wide range of temperatures and compositions to template the epitaxial relationship correctly. Yeah, it's important to remember that you don't need gas phase in the traditional CVD sense to get epitaxy. Um, you need subcritical nucleus material. I actually did traditional CVD work okay. prior to doing CCVD as my dissertation topic. And I learned that you actually make... Uh, small clusters in the regular CVD process. People try to say that all the reaction occurs on the surface, right. but in plasma CVD, the energy isn't on the surface, it's right. in the gas stream. Yeah. And in uh, even in hot-walled uh, uh, reactors, the gas stream is high enough to cause the reaction to occur. It doesn't need to be self-limited to the surface. So we actually did analysis of what the material coming through at the far end was, mm -hmm. and we found a range of uh, nanomaterials coming Interesting. through. Interesting. Um, With traditional CVD. Yeah, no, there's, there's, you know, since our group works on CVD too, there's, there is all these different regimes that you can, you can be in. Um, we don't do a lot of plasma CVD, but I agree with you that when you have uh, energetic particles in the gas phase, it's hard to entirely prevent um, reactivity and um, starting to get things to go, so to speak. You have to really control the process well to make it that it's a surface-limited reaction. 
it's it's so you bring up an interesting point. I mean, I've always uh, plasmas have been really important in the development of the semiconductor industry and and several other industries. And I've always just kind of thought it was interesting how, in a way, it's a very brute force kind of way to break molecules up. Um, and now, uh, with the rise of say atomic layer deposition and a lot of new chemistry coming in to do these surface limited reactions. Um, we're getting really beautiful new ways to control film properties. ALD is definitely a surface limited reaction. Yeah, yeah. If you do it Most right. Of the time, right? <laughs> Some people stack up multiple layers and then react yeah. to multiple layers and it's not right. single layer chemistry. I just I, I love the that we're bringing I think there's more well someone who maybe did plasma chemistry would argue with me, but th- there is a lot now that people are working on where they're pulling in chemists who are doing really interesting work with new types of precursors to get this self-limiting reactivity um, in a way that I feel like if there was a prior incentive, if 20 years ago or 30 years ago there had been um, or a recognition that there was this opportunity to design precursors more carefully um, that we would have. <laughs> yeah. There's been a lot of... Um, new opportunities that are emerging, I think, from this well-controlled surface chemistry. Yeah, well, my big worry working within the liquid regime was always stability, that you wouldn't have any impurity materials that might want to. So uh, some halides sometimes try and get stuck in the film. Right. So you try and avoid halides, yep. try and avoid toxic chemicals because we're trying to be an environmentally friendly process right. and low cost and toxic uh, increases the cost of handling materials. Right. So that that's one of the big things is to actually get something commercialized is you have to be low cost. And so I always try to focus on a low-cost way of uh, doing the manufacturing process. No, and uh, to Nanovation listeners and to myself, we are on board uh, with that idea. Um, you know, you should have been. We should give you an honorary chemical engineering degree as well. <laughs> <laughs> In an electrical engineering okay. also, because okay. <laughs> I, I did uh, RF designs and actually have patents on ground structures for high frequency. Uh, I joke that I'm, I know enough to be dangerous in that field. I'm going to argue no one should give me a degree in electrical engineering, though. Yeah. Um, oh, I don't deserve one, because I, <laughs> I don't know the basic formulas that right. are required. But I... But you, the neat thing is when you work in materials and you work with other experts in the field, you can pigeon in and really get to learn and enjoy a very specific niche of right. another field. For sure. And, and sometimes the equations aren't as helpful as you might like. Yeah. Uh, just figuring it out. It's a new system. The, the, the equation that's for the most basic system doesn't apply in your case and just – Going trial by error empirically is is the way it has to go, I guess even for experts sometimes. Okay, so basically this process is the through line through a lot of NGMAT technology. Yes, and we simplified the name to be nanospray combustion processing. So okay. that way you could use it for either thin films or for powders, and it's one name. And, so how and, are the, the powders different, actually? So I, can, I think most people can envision a substrate that this stuff is flowing towards and sticks to. Yeah. Now, when you make powders, you then – how does that work? How do you collect the powder? What are you doing differently there? Well, you, you, you increase your concentration of your liquid some to ensure that you get homogeneous nucleation. Then the size that you grow the material to has to do with the concentration as well as the length of time above the critical nucleus size temperature. So, you know, depending on the material, like silver, the critical nucleus size for uh, room temperature is somewhere around 20 nanometers. You know, Mm -hmm. a 10 nanometer silver particle is not stable even at room temperature. It'll grow if it touches something else. Other things uh, can be high temperature materials such as alumina, and you can go down to, you know, a couple of nanometers, and it's a stable particle. Do you have to passivate the surface uh, of any of these things? No, uh, but we do sometimes throw in... uh, 
materials at the end to help them from hard agglomerating. Okay. So you you do something that absorbs on the surface that will can be removed later on in the process. So we we make a general material that's sold to Sigma Aldrich. But then sometimes we have direct relationships with people, and they'd say, well, we need to have this in a uh, polar solvent or nonpolar solvent. Right. And you know, sometimes you know, there are even differences in the nonpolar solvents, and you need something to be able to uh, dissolve or wet or you know, right. disperse very, very easily and uniformly in that medium. And so the, whatever the particles see is its last instance before it cools down in its cooling stage yeah you can uh, then have dispersion easier in a medium based on what you allow to absorb on the surface right i just saw an interesting talk um from someone at a company called ald nano solutions uh-huh. and they were talking about you know they, they do fluidized bed ald coating of particles so they'll take particles like you all would produce and in a fluidized bed, these things are all mixing around. They do ALD. And in the early days, it was hard to actually get the patent because everyone skilled in the art just knew that you couldn't fluidize little tiny particles. And it turned out that the ALD process was functionalizing them in a way that allowed them to not agglomerate, whereas most particles of that size would. And so it sounds like you all do something analogous where you're putting in different different uh, adsorbents to to control the surface properties well we actually did nanospray combustion processing where we have an initial flame we make a nanoparticle and then we have a downstream flame where we would put a thin film coating on top of the nanoparticle so a conformal coating around it prior to it consolidating right so it's still gas phase ready to receive a vapor deposition layer i see so it kind of ends up being coarse shell and stuff yes Interesting. Yeah. Um, In a one-step process. Did you ever do any uh, non-spherical kinds of objects? Yeah, Yeah. we did uh, needle, uh, faceted uh, crystals. um, And it all has to do with the amount of time you give it. Materials want to minimize their surface energy. Right. So if they have a preferred growth direction and you give it the time and environment, it'll grow in that direction. Sure, sure. Um, we do a lot of work with uh, metal catalyzed growth process where yeah. if the material isn't going to work for you, you can add a little catalyst that changes the energetics of the system so that you favor ad- adsorption, decomposition in this catalyst and then growth of this wire from this little catalyst particle. Um, I'm curious, when you're processing these powders, um, was there ever a limitation in kind of the ultimate density of the of the material and the flame in the sense that you want high throughput, you want low cost, but ultimately the density you could ultimately achieve was limited by agglomeration prior to any of these adsorbents being added? Or could you just increase the density at will without too much trouble? Well, there's thin film coatings where we're generally trying to get a dense coating. And then there's nanopowders, which are going to be light and fluffy. You know, we have like Syria and other nanopowders that are heavier than glass when you consolidate it. Yeah. But you put it in this jar and you can fluff it around like it's nothing. So in processing those, as they're kind of coming through before you collect them in the jar, so to speak, was there ever kind of a maximum density that you could operate at? Or could you get pretty high densities um, of these particles in the flow during their synthesis oh you're talking about the production rate yeah i guess yeah we we were able to uh, achieve uh well over a kilogram an hour with a standard size flame okay uh, and then we scaled that and we were able to achieve uh 25 kilograms an hour production rates okay yeah but then there it could go scaled even larger uh, because, I mean, flames have been used to process nanoparticles for 100 years. Right. Carbon black, yeah, sure. fume silica, right. fume titania. They have inexpensive, low-cost, gas-based precursors that they just put into a flame and they make it. Right. And uh, one of the things I tell people is one of the most nano-engineered products 
basically every adult American owns four of them. Tires. <laughs> Tires, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, a hundred years ago, they hardly lasted any amount of time. Now they last 60, 70 you know, years. Miles. And it's because of the nanomaterials that are incorporated in with the rubbers and plastics. That's that's awesome. Um, and so that's why having someone like Andrew here is fantastic, because he has this perspective on uh, what is now called the field of nanotechnology, whereas before, when he first sat down, we, I said to him that we we're going to talk a little bit about um, the founding of NGMAT and what the nano scene was like. And he said no one called it nanotechnology. So can you take us back there to the kind of earlier mid-90s? Um, you know, what was the mindset like? Well, uh, it was mostly around thin films. You know, there was the big electronics industry, the glass industry, and a lot of other people were wanting thin films for different things. And so I came up with this non-vacuum-based process right. where you could process outside of a vacuum chamber with low-cost chemicals. So everything was slanted towards the uh, thin films. And no one worried if the thin film was less than 100 nanometers and trying to call it nanotechnology. If it did the job, you right. grew it as thin as you could so it would be as cheap as possible. That, that, <laughs> um, so it kind of came out of necessity of, of be, making things low cost, perhaps. So. And, and in fact, from a thin film perspective, when they were first realizing this change in materials issue, which ended up being a blessing— it was tunneling and other issues from getting some of the material so thin that their properties weren't consistent anymore. I see. Electrically, for yeah. example. Yeah. Um, what was it um, that led you to want to found NGMAT? Well, I came up with a process as part of my dissertation, and uh, it got a very good attention from a broad range of companies when I would present and I applied for small business innovative research grants. I was actually writing those prior to finishing my graduation. Okay. And, uh, and this was mostly self-motivated? It wasn't something your advisor uh, was suggesting? Uh, well, there, yeah, there was one of the professors on my committee that had won a couple of SBIRs and before, and he told me about the program. And okay. I went and attended one of the national meetings. Mm -hmm. I learned it's a 15% award rate. So I said, I'll write 10. <laughs> if I don't win any of those, I'm going to go work for someone. So, But that's an interesting philosophy because I think most people would say a 15% award rate I'm just going to go work for somebody. <laughs> you said I'll write 10. Yeah. So I uh, won two of the first 10 that I wrote. Okay. And uh, that started it all off. So that in and of itself. Bootstrapped the company for over the first four years. Okay. So those two awards combined were what amount of money? A couple hundred thousand? Uh, like uh, I think one was 50. The other one was 100,000. So 150,000. Okay. Uh both of them went on to phase twos. In okay. fact, the company uh, won uh, over 50 phase twos. So wow. it's the most, I think, at least seven or eight years ago was the most in Georgia's history, so phase two wins. So let's talk about this bootstrapping, because I think most listeners or many listeners will be familiar with kind of venture capital funded things that they're hearing about coming out of Silicon Valley. Clearly, that's not necessarily manufacturing often software and at least today it is and i think hearing a bit about what what it's like to bootstrap and why you bootstrap uh would would be useful so can you tell us about that well i mean there was basically no venture capital uh industry hardly any uh especially in the high tech field back in georgia back in the low, early 90s right so there was venture capital for some more traditional businesses and everything. Um, and the SBIR program allowed you to maintain ownership in the company. So uh, I saw that. And then mm -hmm. companies started funding us, too, and started to pay licensing fees and okay. build relationships with us. We had a 100% growth rate for the first uh, five years of the company. 
And then we did decide to take in some venture capital and some uh, strategic investors also invested in the company. And then came the crash, <laughs> the tech crash. The late 90s. Yeah, yeah the 2000s. So okay. uh, we actually uh, got up to 100 people. And I saw most of my peers disappear. They ran into the wall at 90 miles an hour and just burned through their cash and disappeared. And I uh, trimmed back, which is a hard thing to do. You know, you're cutting good people and, you know, reducing programs right. is a tough thing. But uh, we went back to just our bootstrap mode where we were working on a cash flow basis. Right. And the company over the majority of its years was a profitable company. Of course, we were a negative burn rate when we took in the equity investments right. and the tech uh, spiral and then crash. And this was um, because I guess the, the, if in the tech crash, like it's funny, I always think of it as kind of the, the web folks bringing the whole thing down, but it, it was broader than that. Uh, and so in technology, in semiconductor work, there wasn't as much demand all of a sudden. Uh, there was uh, almost none at all. Okay. Uh, and we were basically going back to government needs, military needs, right. and uh, very specific company needs that had dire needs because all the company uh, R&D funding dried up also during the tech crash. Everyone right. was just pulling in their horns. So it, it was... a tough few years yeah. but uh we we survived um and what was the competitive space like before the crash you guys were obviously doing well um but you must have had competitors well we didn't have any competitors in our patented ccvd process i see so you know we were the only ones now we had people trying to mimic it and basically in infringing the patent and okay. we would just I would just go and meet with the CEO and let him know that, you know, it's it's not worth trying to pursue. You know, we have this patent. I go over the details yeah. of the patents with them and, and just have good conversations. I, I also saw in some fields where companies would, uh, instead of meeting with one another, hire patent attorneys. Immediately. And, and go into lawsuits with each other. With both cra companies crashing out of the cost and expense of the right. uh, patent litigation. So taking a step back, you bring up an interesting point that we haven't really talked about much on the podcast, but it's something I've run into or at least thought about, uh, and that is uh, process patents uh, as different from other kinds of widget-like patents uh, and yeah. the challenge of protecting. And I've, I've talked to a lot of people who say, just keep it as a trade secret. Um, but, you know, can you tell us a bit more about that? If you have a broad use, uh, really novel process patent, I would recommend uh, patenting that. Okay. You know, if you have an innovation that's just groundbreaking and mm -hmm. everything. But then you got to file your best mode, so file it early. Yeah. And then all of your tweaks and improvements you do after that keep trade secret. Interesting. So... Um, but if you have just a tweak improvement off an existing process, mm -hmm. keep it trade streaky. Don't, okay. don't, don't. Okay. Don't keep, so let get it the up. big one up front. Yep. Right. And, and then maintain most of everything else uh, trade secret, unless it comes to a new composition of matter, which can be enforced well, or a structure or right. a device. Right. And we have a we want a, a lot of those different types of patents. Because of the flexibility of the process we had, we could combine elements I and see. you know put them on different substrates. We were putting things on plastics that you know other people couldn't put on plastics, right? Because you can't put a plastic in a high temperature chamber. Really. But the key here for for listeners, right, is that you could go with a spectrometer or something, and you could determine what the composition of that film was, and it would know immediately whether someone was infringing on your patent. Versus the process, which is hidden in many ways. It's a fleeting kind of thing. Once it's done, it's done. Yeah. It's hard to tell whether someone exactly used that process, which is where you can get kind of sticky. Yeah. Also, it's hard to enforce your patents against big companies. Yeah. You, know, you, you have maybe a few million dollars, and a good patent infringement case is going to cost you more than $10 million. And they have... 
tens of millions of dollars and uh, or more. Yeah. And so how do you deal so with that it, aspect of it? Th- this is one real issue we have with our patent system. Yeah. It, it really is the rich come out ahead in the patent system as it is. It's not like someone robbed a bank. And the bank doesn't have to hire policemen to go catch the robber. The policemen are there. <laughs> right. They're part of yeah. society <laughs> to catch that robber. It's a good analogy. Um, but there is no police for intellectual property. Right. Now, um, some of our uh, the FBI and other has been trying to help high-tech small companies dealing with patent infringement from some of the uh, international uh, countries that like to infringe Uh patents more and have been uh, trying to work with the small companies to teach them how to maintain their trade secrets better, make it harder to infiltrate your databases and other things like that, in particular if you're also working on military items uh, with your technology. They'd like they like to help. They, they, they like to help you <laughs> be very secure right. with your information. And so uh, th- th- there is some help, but there's no policeman that's going to enforce your patent for you. you got to have a big bankroll and be willing to be distracted with uh, – mind-numbingly low intellectual discussions with uh, attorneys for many many hours and <laughs> <laughs> yeah i've um i've done a, i've done a couple since i've been at tech and we've kind of saved um saved or limited the number we've submitted to the ones we feel are the most impactful um luckily the attorneys have been that I've gotten lucky, maybe, uh, to work work with good attorneys to to write these patents. But I find that that world is still feels very foreign. Oh, patent attorneys are generally uh, very well versed. Oh, okay. It, I'm sorry, I misunderstood. It's the litigators. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, I see. <laughs> that twist and turn and try and you know just. This is the thing about science, I think, versus the law. Because I, I think there's a lot of. It, as far as disciplines go, they, they have, in terms of how they operate, there's a lot of similarities in terms of making arguments and supporting your case. Scientists and lawyers do it the same uh, in many ways, except science ultimately uh, is backed up by the laws of the universe. And so th- those are hard to break. Uh, and <laughs> the rest of it is sometimes the foundation shifts underneath you, right? We're, we're learning new ways to bend the laws and to apply the laws, and right. that's that's what we're doing. And it's, it's such a fascinating field. And that's one of the nice things about nanotechnology is the definition that I like to use is you have some dimensionality of less than 100 nanometers, but – you also have some change in properties because of that small dimension is an important part of the definition of a nanomaterial. Okay. So then we're not in my group doing too much nano, (laughs) although they are nano in some dimension. Um, But we like to take advantage of the process aspects. And and you guys are, uh, NGMAT is a beautiful example of process uh, and, and what can come from innovative processing. Um, do you have a sense for, uh, let's come back to the process. Do you have a sense for whether we're investing the right amount in process innovation versus materials or widget innovation? I'm biased here as the listeners know. Yeah. (laughs) You're probably the widget guy. No, no, I'm the process guy. You're the process guy. Oh, yeah. So we had a whole podcast, the 51st episode. Maybe I should send it to you, Uh, send you the article I wrote uh, with a colleague on process innovation. Yeah. Um, What are your thoughts? I think process innovations are really useful to be able to create new materials right. and tweaking and understanding processes is to be able to bend that is a certain mind mm-hmm. um, and then to be able to understand how materials can be played with and how their properties might change if you alter their size and mm-hmm. or their composition and how they interplay and work with one another is um, another mind and sometimes right. they're the same mind sometimes you have to collaborate to get right. that 
but then you have to have where it's used in the end place another set of experts or multiple experts. Right. Uh, sometimes there's a person that knows the physics behind it, another person that understands how the product has to function with it. So you, sometimes you have two or three people on the end letting you understand what you're trying to drive to so it's a practical end application. No, that, that certainly, certainly. Um, I think sometimes we get, we, because the processes are uh, fleeting, right? They're hard to see when you look at the final product. The process is embedded in it. Uh, and sometimes, and many times, I think the process disappears once you've reached the end of the process and you hold the product in your hand, that we forget um, that that thing we're holding is dependent on a process and that the process dictates the compositional space you maybe can achieve, thus the property space. And finding new ways to process opens up, and as you guys have successfully done, opens up all sorts of new spaces for materials, uh, structure, composition, and properties that... Um, you wouldn't have had if you stuck to the conventional process. Yeah, we set world records in many different areas uh, based on directives of what they said they would need. And too many times you go down that path and then either the product doesn't make it in the marketplace yeah. or what they thought they needed isn't actually what they needed. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they think they need this and you know, pay lots of money and put lots of time into the research of it being done. Right. But then when you actually accomplish all the objectives that were slated, it still didn't perform to how they were hoping it would perform. Interesting. And then they just would say, okay, we're going to, we're going to walk away from yeah. this. Yeah. Fascinating. Yeah. So you, you, you'd hit a home run and, uh, but, a no one, no, but, but no one was on base or you <laughs> skipped touching third base when right. you did the round. So you don't get the credit for the home run. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. I mean, these are, this is all great perspective. Um, the, the challenges that are faced, I guess you, there are similar things in a research lab. Um, we, we were basically a research lab yeah, so yeah. that were focused on, you know, making long-term profits. So you then have a, a, a baseline or a foundational catalog of materials, but then people come to you and say, I need something that does this. Uh, do you do it? And if you don't, can I pay you to develop it? Does that happen sometimes? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. We uh, one time did a compositional study they bought some one of our standard nanopowders that had three cations in it and they said well we think this fourth one would help it and we're not sure the stoichiometry we want so we did a 30 point uh, manufacturing uh, screen grid for them and then they did trials on it and found Absolutely. what one was that one that worked better for them Interesting. and okay. enhanced the performance so let's talk about nano today um, get your perspective on kind of where you see things going in the next, uh, let's say, five to ten years. Uh, maybe what you think is overhyped today and maybe what's underhyped. Well, the really big hype was about ten years ago when there was a whole bunch of companies that came out with nanotechnology in their names and everything. And uh, I've seen most of them go away also. It sounds like you've almost seen waves, because in the 90s, it was you and some competitors, more or less, and then most of them went away with the crash, uh, and then Nano kind of got popular again, and many of them are gone in 2019. Yes. So I yeah. guess I'm thinking, what, what gives you this longevity, one, <laughs> and two, I'm still thinking, what's next? Well, once again, back in the 2000s, um, nanotechnology became hyped up. And a whole bunch of companies got venture capital money. Yeah. So they didn't have any revenue basis. And the right. VCs got tired of supporting them after a certain number of years. And there was the crash of 2009. Mm -hmm. And they went away. Gotcha. And they weren't cash flow based. We, we did raise uh, equity back in the 99-2000 time frame. But then we didn't uh, later on. And we just grew, you know, based on our revenues and right. maintained profitability most of the years there was one year where we had a small negative but we had built up a cash reserve so it was, it was fine handle it okay so 10 years after the crash of 0809 here we are 
you know what what are the hot topics today in the in the nano industry i mean as an academic i don't feel like i'm very connected at all with it so i want to hear from you what what you think's going on there when i go to conferences i hear people talking about uh nanotechnology and everything and then i get to the questions at the end of their talk and i go um i didn't see any dimensionality less than 100 nanometers and i didn't see any differentiation in properties because of the small size Uh why are you calling this nanotechnology and they're just kind of like well it's a key word that helps uh, us move forward <laughs> you know, type right. answer. So I, I think that it's really interesting how you can take some things in like battery materials, lithium battery materials. You make it smaller, and instead of 1C charge rates, you can go to 10C charge rates or right. 20C charge rates. It's, it's almost becoming a uh, capacitor. Mm-hmm. It's an electrochemical capacitor rather than a traditional battery by going to the small sizes. Right. But you have to build the whole structure right so the electrons can flow in and out right and the you know replacement ions can be in there correctly. So you got to think of the whole system and not just the nanoparticle itself so too many times it's a complex uh compound or relationship of multiple materials that enable the end performance so i think that's the key now is being able to understand how the different materials it's like interfaces and thin films you know if you don't have the right uh, work function between mm-hmm. two layers, it's not going to work properly right. electronically. Or it might delaminate later or something like that. Yeah, it won't be bound, bonded strong enough, and it'll, it'll have thin film stresses, and it'll right. buckle off the surface. Yeah. So we can make lots of things that maybe are a nano in your definition. The challenge now is incorporating them into actual technologies when you're talking about something complex like a battery or beyond. And at cost effective, I can't, I mean, just that is so tight because we did state-of-the-art battery, you know, research 10 years ago. We had the very best performing uh, battery materials, but then all these batteries guys were wanting it for 10 or 20 bucks a kilogram, you know, and, you know, we have a low cost process. It's not $10,000 a kilogram, right? but it's still hundreds to a couple of thousand dollars right. a kilogram and to get down to 10 or 20 where they need it yeah. is, is, is it's a is, it's a tough market tough it, industry it's really tough yeah really tough so we, we found a number of niches where we're selling material at good volumes but the super high volume ones the really broadly used ones right like for tires it has to be cheap yeah for sure for sure I mean, unless you come up with an application that people really want to pay a lot of money for. Um, and that's the interesting thing about, uh, let's say, integrated circuits. But there's, there's a lot of value embedded in that, in that circuit. Um, yeah. So it, it's, it, yeah, so it's funny. People, people like to talk about what is scalable, right? And s- scalable um, is, is, is a lot to do with how much you can sell the end product for. <laughs> Yeah. Um, relative to what the precursors cost and the cost of the of the process, not so much uh, can it be done in a hood in a beaker. That's that's not often as relevant as some people like to think. Yeah, and thin films for some applications have to be a penny or less per square foot. Right there, you go, penny or less per square foot. Okay, let's let's put that uh, back in the, our minds and not forget it. It's a good good um, rule of thumb. Yeah, for industries such as like the food packaging for enhanced barrier protection. And uh, then you have applications such as for automobile glass and, you know, windshields sure. and other things like that, which can afford a little more price but have very, very, uh, you know, demanding performance criteria right. as far as longevity. Uh-huh. And so now you you have to worry about things sticking to your nano surface that's going to defunctionalize your nano surface. It's working great, yeah. But and it can work great for months, but can it work a year or two? Right. And in, in the and Georgia the, sun, yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> and all the rest of it. Yeah. Finding high value products is a key piece of this in terms of being successful, um, or a process that's so. Um, 
powerful that you could make these more or add value to existing products without increasing the cost by that much. Right. Yeah. But you get into companies where someone on a manufacturing line doesn't want to change anything. They are so yeah. resistant to change. They've worked so hard to try and get everyone to follow all the criteria to be making a good product. They're very resistant to change on that uh, production line. It's amazing. Yeah. And I guess that's the challenge of going and trying to bring in uh, a value add to an existing material or product versus potentially enabling a different area where there's no preconceived notions about what it means to, to build said widget. Um, but that's, that's a whole different ballgame over there. Yeah. Um, okay, so about a year, year and a half ago, you took a step back from, from NGMAT. Yeah, I, I decided that I've been doing this for almost 25 years, yeah. and uh, I've had you know more success than all the other companies that have basically <laughs> yeah. disappeared, but I wasn't growing in the big company that I had envisioned okay. when I uh, started the company. And I decided that uh, I, I, I'd had enough, uh-huh. and uh, I think the company had had enough of me, so I decided to hire a Wharton MBA and uh, technologist that uh, could take my place. So I hired two people to take me out okay. and uh, left it in their good hands. And so if you look at your LinkedIn profile, it says you're currently on sabbatical. Yeah. Um, can you give anyone hints at what's next for Andrew Hunt? I'm I'm thinking of trying to uh, do the, the a real game changer. Okay. So, okay. Uh, and uh I'm being I'm toying with the idea of trying to dive in deep to make fusion power real. Okay. Talk about a game changer. That <laughs> counts. <laughs> that, excellent. <laughs> well, we'll then we will stay tuned and uh when we get closer we'll have you back on to the show and hear all about that. Um, But Andrew, thank you for taking a few minutes to be on the show today. You're welcome, Mike. It's a pleasure speaking with you. You've been listening to Nanovation. If you enjoyed the show, please leave a rating or write a review on Apple Podcasts. Show notes are available at fillerlab.com forward slash nanovation. Nanovation is recorded in the Marcus Nanotechnology Building on the campus of Georgia Tech. Andrew Cannon edits the show. I'm Mike Filler. See you next time.